So good morning to everybody. I thank you very much for the chance to talk to you uh, about this work. I work as a pathologist and as a scientist, and uh, so I'm going to present some work that we did to ask a simple question. If you had a cell barrier in the way of a nanoparticle, would the barrier act as a barrier? Would there be any change on the other side or not? And there are a lot of people that have helped with this work. So the fact that I'm giving this talk doesn't mean, say, I've done the work. I haven't done the work. A lot of people have done this work to help. So what is, the, what is a barrier? Well, according to the Oxford Dictionary, a barrier is a fence or other obstacle that prevents movement or access. And in um, the body, there are a lot of different barriers uh, one of the most exposed to environmental nanoparticles, of course, is in the eye, the cornea. There is the blood-brain barrier, um, and all these barriers are slightly different. The blood-brain barrier is essentially a monolayer of endothelial cells with astrocytic end feet, whilst the corneal barrier is a multilayered barrier. And then we have the barrier that we're quite interested in at the moment, which is the placenta which is the interface between the maternal blood and the fetus. Now, the placenta is presented with a lot of toxins by toxins within the maternal bloodstream, and uh, some of these toxins will actually get through whatever, such as radiation. Otherwise, toxins such as alcohol, drugs, hormones, cigarettes, viruses, and metals may be present in the mother's blood. And the fetus may be damaged as a response uh, to this toxic exposure. And the fetus is damaged according to its gestation. So it's most critically vulnerable early on in pregnancy and later, less so later on in pregnancy. And one could argue that this critical exposure early on in pregnancy is simply due to the stage of embryogenesis, that there are major uh, changes, major organs being developed at these stages. Nonetheless, the first trimester, especially the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, depending on the target tissue, is critical. Now, there are a lot of different potential exposures that might occur, exposures from the environment, exposures certainly as we develop new nanomedicines medicines that may be injected into the bloodstream. And our particular focus in Bristol was on a hip implant uh, because these metal implants may generate particles simply due to wear. And every time you may step, take a step, there may be uh, billions and billions of billions of particles that are generated. This shows the way that particles may be generated. In some implants, you have a stem, which is a metal uh, which will then articulate in the pelvis on a cup. And that can either be soft, as in a polyethylene um, uh, material, or it can be hard, as in a metal material. The metal-on-metal -metal articulations tend, because they're two hard surfaces, to produce nanoparticles, whilst in contrast, the metal-on-soft implants, such as metal-on-polyethylene, they tend to produce rather larger particles. So these particles come away. And we were interested in whether these were inert. Now, the material, the metal material, is uh, an alloy, and it can be stainless steel or cobalt chromium alloy or titanium vanadium aluminium. And when we had a look at the bone marrow that surrounded the stem, in which there were ions and nanoparticles, we saw evidence of damage to chromosomes. The cobalt and chromium are mutagens, and we saw that they were uh, breaks in the chromatid or chromosome and we also noted in the peripheral blood of some of the patients that there was a change in the composition of the chromosome number and you had a change from as in here a normal carrier type to a aneuploidy in the peripheral blood in some of the peripheral blood lymphocytes so potentially these things are able to cause some change to DNA and chromosomes and so the question was if you had a barrier in the way, in other words, if you had a placenta in the way, would a fetus be or not be vulnerable to this change? So would they damage cells across the barrier? Would they indeed need to get across the barrier to do this? 
would all types of particles damage cells? And what would be the mechanism? So we couldn't answer this question looking at epidemiology. There simply aren't the follow-up of patients to be able to answer the question. Instead, we had to try to model it. Now, our model may not be at all correct, but it nonetheless gave us a question. So <coughs> we uh, used particles of different size to imitate the, the, the question using nanoparticles of about 30 nanometers in diameter and comparing their actions against larger particles, which would be about 3 microns in diameter. And we had to model the human placenta. And on the left-hand side, you have the human placenta in the first three months of pregnancy. It's a bilayered barrier between the mother's blood, which you have here, and the fetal blood vessels, which you have here. And you have a, a barrier of syncytia trophoblast, which is the outer layer, and underneath you have a layer of cytotrophoblast. So it looks a very formidable barrier. We had to use this, we had to try and model this, and we decided to model it using a transwell insert. So we have your transwell insert, you make a barrier here, you have cells beneath the barrier to try and imitate what, what the fetal, uh, potential fetal cells would be, and you put materials above the barrier. And that's what it actually looks like. So we have our uh, we used a BWO cell in this uh, instance. A BWO cell isn't precisely a human trophoblast because it's a choriocarcinoma cell line, but people have great difficulties in actually making confluent barriers, and they have up to now using primary cells, which I'll come to in a moment. And we put materials above the barrier, and we used nanoparticles in, in this instance. We had to be careful that our barriers weren't damaged, and we had to, we had to use... Uh, various tests, whether it was electron microscopy or tests of electrical resistance or indeed uh, tests of uh, dye transfer across the barrier using different fluorescent dyes. And we assessed the level of change uh, beneath the, in the cells beneath the barrier through a number of different tests of DNA damage, one of which is very conveniently the comet assay, where the nuclear material is labelled with fluorescent dye and you apply it, and you put this into a gel, you apply a current across the gel, and if there, are, if there are broken strands of DNA, these are smaller, and they will then migrate with the electric current and form a comet tail. And so this gives a measure of the amount, very visual and uh, quantitative measure, of the amount of DNA damage. Now, when we were doing our experiments, we had to have a number of different controls for this exposure. So we had to have, firstly, a control of no exposure at all. A, secondly, a control where we had no cells in our plastic insert, but we just simply exposed the cells beneath the barrier through the plastic insert. In other words, would the plastic add potential change to our system? We also had a control where the cells, where there was no barrier in place at all, and the cells were directly exposed to the materials. And then finally we had our test material, where you had both plastic insert and cells as our barrier. And we have two different uh, tests of damage here. The top layer is our comet assay, which this is a, this is a measure of DNA breaks, and it looks at single strand breaks double strand breaks and alkaline label sites. And beneath that, correspondingly, these graphs refer to the level of double strand breaks. And they are measured through immunocytochemistry where you label gamma H2AX foci. And we have control where there is no exposure. The control where, the where you had your plastic insert but no cells above it. A direct exposure to the materials and the material through the barrier. And we decided to use three different types of exposures, exposures to nanoparticles, exposure to the micron particles, and exposure here to ions. And so what we saw was that uh, the direct and uh, exposures caused damage, both the, uh, no matter which type of exposure you had, whether you had ions, micron particles, or nanoparticles, 
exposure through the insert. The insert is a transwell insert, has little holes in it. So it's not, complete, it's not a, a complete barrier in itself. It has small pores where materials trickle through. So there was some damage there, but you can see that when you have cells above it, paradoxically and unexpectedly, we had damage through our system. And not only did we have uh, uh, damage, but we had more damage than when we had our insert in place. So in other words, the cells in the barrier are doing something. And you'll see this more, even more dramatically when we look at double strand breaks. The level of damage through the barrier is more often than when you actually directly expose the cells. So this barrier not only has an effect, it has quite a strong effect. And this is true both for any of these exposures, including for ionic exposures. So what's happening? Well, one thing that could happen would be that the materials would actually get through the barrier. It seems unlikely that the, the, the effect through the barrier would be stronger than a direct exposure, if that was true. But nonetheless, we might have some very strange low-dose effect, even though in this last slide we used two different doses here, um, we saw a dose response, making that slightly unlikely. However, when you look at electron microscopy of the barriers, we found that 95% of all the particles were present in the top layer of a bilayered barrier. Did we have any metal getting through? Well, we looked at, we looked at the particle to see where they affected by this internalization within the barrier using XPX, and we're dealing with a cobalt and chromium particle, and we found that the, level, the amount of cobalt in the particles did actually decrease after the cells were internalized. Moreover, when we had a look at the fluids beneath the barriers, and we measured the, uh, the concentration in the fluids, either just in the fluid itself, not in the cells, after a direct exposure or an indirect exposure compared to control, we did find mainly that there was an increase of cobalt beneath the barrier, not so much of the other elements of the particles. So we have a small trickle of cobalt coming through. So we would have to suggest that maybe it's the cobalt, if there is a direct exposure, that might be responsible for this change. We also saw that the barrier itself was affected and there was a change in the mitochondria, which I'll come back to. But are there alternative explanations for how you can get damage across the barrier? Well, there is a strange effect in radiology, in radiobiology, called the bystander effect. And here, if you irradiate a cell directly with radiation, and this could be all sorts of radiation, including particulate radiation, this cell that's directly exposed is able to send a message to a neighboring cell. That's why it's called a bystander effect, or a nearest neighbor effect. And it seems to be able to do this in two ways. It seems to be able to secrete things into the culture medium, such as lipid peroxides or reactive oxygen species that will cause DNA damage in a neighbor. So that's actually into the culture fluid. Or it can secrete something through a gap junction. Now, potentially in our barrier, we have these two forms of communication. Within the barrier cells, because it's a multi-layer barrier, we may have the gap junction, and certainly from the barrier to the cells beneath, we have the, culture, the, the tissue culture fluid. So potentially there was an analogy. So therefore this role of gap junction signaling was an important role to investigate to see whether there was any way in we which we had intercellular signaling as being responsible, especially if the particles are accumulating in the top layer. Somehow the bottom layer needs to be affected in order to send the signal, should this be the process. So doing electron microscopy of the barriers, we could establish that this barrier, this multicellular barrier, had indeed got gap junctions between the layers of the cells. And to investigate, to interrogate the role of gap junction signaling, we use connexin mimetic peptides. These are the most precise ways of altering gap junctions. They do, I have to say, uh, alter hemichannels as well. So cell signaling is complex. 
Uh, there are hemichannels on the surface of cells. If two cells join together, these two hemichannels dock to form a gap junction. But otherwise, materials can be secreted from hemichannels. So these mimetic peptides will block both. But we, we did several experiments. We put this mimetic peptide above the barrier, and this is our particle exposed barrier, and this is the barrier where we have uh, used this mimetic peptide to block the gap junctions. And we can see that blocking gap junctions or hemichannels was very effective indeed in preventing the damage beneath the barrier, showing, suggesting that signaling is important. Likewise, if you put these materials beneath the barrier, you also have this effect. Now, of course, there aren't any gap junctions beneath the barrier, but there are potentially hemichannels beneath the barrier. So, th in this circumstance, these would be blocked. And we can find that this blocking of the junctions will affect the DNA damage that we saw in the comet assay, which are all the graphs above, but it also affects the double strand breaks, which is the graph here, and it also seems to affect the cytogenetic response. Now, interestingly, uh, and this argues against us having a direct exposure, the cytogenetic response of the cells beneath the barrier was quite different to when you directly exposed them to the materials. When we had a look at the cytogenetics of the cells beneath the barrier, we had tetraploidy, not aneuploidy. So the damage across the barrier creates a new type of damage. It creates tetraploidy, not aneuploidy. So potentially quite different signaling molecules or DNA damaging molecules or cytogenetic inducing molecules are being released from the barrier compared to the native materials. Another way to show that signaling might be important is to use a molecule that might increase gap junction signaling. And we used a particular octopeptide called AAP10. When we applied that to the barrier, we found an increase of DNA damage, again suggesting perhaps that gap junction signaling or hemichannel signaling is important in this signaling across the barrier. Do these barriers actually contain the necessary requirements for signaling? Well, we had to use molecular biology, and closely related to the gap junction or hemichannel, connexin hemichannel, is a panexin channel. There are a lot of these complicated channels and a huge variety of these complicated channels. And it's a very complicated subject. And as a lab, we stray a lot from our comfort zone. So we rely very heavily on collaborations with experts. So we were interested, okay, so we've seen connexin channels might be important. What about panexin channels? Could they too be important in this signaling process? And what about the receptors? and what types of molecules might be secreted through gap junctions or hemichannels. There are a lot of small molecules that are secreted through them, and one molecule is ATP. And ATP certainly will go through a panexin channel and will certainly uh, be affected by the particular receptors called P2X or P2Y receptors. So we did a molecular screen for all these different types of things, and we had a look in our barrier cells, in the cells beneath, and we found that they were, pro they were present. We then <coughs> asked a question, okay, so they're there. What happens if you block these types of receptors? Uh, we, we used a particular agent called compound 17, and we had a look to see whether this might influence the signaling through the barrier. We also mimicked the barrier signaling using ATP as a potential uh, uh, molecule that might be important in transmission. Again, looking at the DNA damage beneath it. And we found that this ATP could induce signaling and also that the blockage of the panexin channel uh, receptor, uh, the, sorry, the P2X uh, receptor, uh, would, uh, blocking that receptor would prevent the signaling. So potentially there is a role for ATP transmission and release through either a hemichannel or a gap junction. We also blocked the panexin channel itself using a compound called panexin-1 and found a reduction of the signaling 
through the barrier. So the barrier signaling is undoubtedly extremely complicated. What happens if you alter ATP, if this is a molecule that is important in this signaling? The one way to do this is to hydrolyze the ATP using apyrase. Um, another way is actually to block the purinergic receptor using a compound called PPADS. These were also effective in preventing the DNA damage. Is there a role for um, a, a reactive oxygen species or xanthine oxidase? Uh, we tested this and suggested maybe there is a role for xanthine oxidase, as in the bystander effect. So what about the actual signaling molecule? What might it be? We don't know what this might be, but we were interested in things that might be released from our barrier. We noted that um, we noticed an interesting artifact that when we incubated the barrier using bovine um, serum, that we had a release of um, bovine transferrin from our barrier. Initially, we thought this was interesting with relation to the transport of iron across a placenta, but then discovered that what we'd seen as transferrin was actually bovine transferrin and was probably derived from the culture medium itself. However, the fact that it was specifically released from the barrier suggested a possibility that, as well as small molecules released from a barrier, you might also get larger release of molecules from the barrier. But anyway, so we'd seen transferrin released across the barrier. We've seen this trickle of cobalt across the barrier. We've also suggested that maybe a role for ATP across the barrier. Would any of those molecules cause DNA damage in fibroblasts? So when we used the same levels of cobalt, we saw no change. When we used ATP, directly exposing the fibroblasts, we did see DNA damage. And when we used different types of transferrin, we saw no damage. So the only thing that was actually responsive was this ATP. That's not to say it is the molecules that may be causing the DNA damage, but it has potential actions on it. And we could block that specifically uh, using PPADS, suggesting it was a receptor-mediated effect. Is there a, um, in signaling process, calcium is a key molecule. So we were interested to see whether calcium signaling might be important on, in our barrier. We used FURA in, um, uh, as a useful tool, fluorescent tool for looking at uh, signaling. And we could see a calcium wave in our uh, barrier cells. And we could block that using a particular blocker of P2Y uh, receptors. So it was, uh, and we could initiate it with ATP. So ATP itself will act on our barrier cell, will cause calcium, um, and you can block it via a receptor, suggesting that ATP transmission is also potentially important. And we also had a look at the role of calcium signaling using um, uh, things that may alter um, calcium signaling, cyclosporin, for example, which will act on calcineurin, um, suggesting perhaps that there is a role within the barrier cell of calcineurin in this calcium wave propagation. So what might it look like? We don't know what it actually looks like, but we uh, suggested a potential model in which you might have barrier signaling. And our model suggests that if you have a particle or an ion, that this might actually get inside the cell or have an action on the cell, and it may cause a damage to the mitochondria. Second, you may have a signaling from the top layer of the cell to the bottom layer of the cell with ATP, either coming through a panexin channel or a connexin hemichannel, or a gap junction. This may either act on the receptor here and leads to a wave of calcium, which then in turn causes subsequent ATP transmission with potential paracrine effects, such as known to exist between panexin channels or connexin channels. And some molecule is then released that causes damage in the fibroblast, in the cells beneath. 
including the possibility of protein release. So we have a sort of similar effect to a bystander signaling. In other words, we have this potential cell-to-cell -cell damage through gap junctions, and we also have the damage uh, with release of materials into the culture medium, similar to what others have described with this bystander signaling. Okay, so this is, it may not happen in vivo, but it potentially happens in vitro. Is it potentially relevant? Now, as I mentioned before, the embryo is critically damaged in the first three months of pregnancy, less so in the later stages of pregnancy. And interestingly, the structure of the placenta, this barrier, changes in pregnancy. So in the first three months of pregnancy, here's mother's blood, here are the baby's blood vessels, you'll see there's a thick bilayered barrier, such as the one that we've been studying with this um, mechanism of signaling. However, at term, it's quite different. Here's mother's blood, here are the fetal blood vessels. You'll notice two things. Firstly, the barrier is a lot thinner. Secondly, it's predominantly monolayered. Thirdly, the fetal vessels are very close to the barrier. So if there's signaling going on, it's potentially very dangerous signaling because the fetal will be very closely exposed to any signals from the barrier. So it's important to look at whether a monolayer will signal. To do this, we had to make monolayered barriers. Well, that's quite easy with a BWO cell. You can just grow them for less time, so they won't heap up. So we had to validate that we could make a monolayer, a confluent monolayer, such as we've done here, and compare the effects with what would happen if you had a bilayered barrier. And again, these are the pictures of our monolayered barrier compared to the bilayered barrier. And this is a monolayered barrier, and that's a bilayered barrier. And what we saw was very unexpected. The monolayered barrier doesn't signal. You need two layers to signal. This intercellular communication between the top layer and the bottom layer is vital for the signaling to take place. Now, in the body, there are a lot of monolayered barriers. And it's very interesting. I work as a pathologist and look down a microscope and see the monolayer barrier, for example, in the mesothelial um, in the abdomen that, layer, that covers the, uh, the gut, also in the thorax that will cover the, both visceral and parietal pleura. These are minute, wafer-thin barriers, monolayer barriers. You also see the barrier in the blood-brain barrier, predominantly a monolayer barrier. So potentially, although they look highly insignificant, if you look at them down the microscope, potentially these, nature has devised a very, very effective barrier. A barrier that is, despite its thinness, is actually perfect for preventing signaling across it in these key sites. In order to explore this potential difference, we needed to further characterize the signaling in the barrier. So we established, first of all, that you could get an induction of free radicals, because I mentioned the possibility that mitochondria were important. So yes, there are free radicals in the barrier. What about different stimuli to barriers? We've talked about ATP having an effect in um, monolayer in, in barriers. Um, what about other things, such as things that might specifically induce free radicals? So here we used a compound called antimycin A compared to rotenone. Antimycin A will generate mitochondrial free radicals which will then lead to superoxide within the cytoplasm. What about <coughs> natural stimuli? We've talked about a lot about sort of metals. What happens if you induce mitochondrial free radicals more physiologically? So here we altered the oxygen layer level in our barriers and we uh, grew the barriers in a hypoxic environment and then suddenly increased it to atmospheric oxygen. In other words, hypoxia reoxygenation, which is known to induce mitochondrial free radicals. And we compared the actions if the barrier was monolayered compared to when the barrier was bilayered. And in, under those circumstances, 
the bilayer barriers signaled, the monolayer barriers did not signal. Moreover, you could prevent the damage from these different stimuli, either by blocking the gap junctions or by blocking the mitochondrial free radicals using a compound called MitoQ, which is a, an antioxidant that selectively gets inside the mitochondria and specifically blocks the actions of mitochondrial free radicals. Again, highlighting the potential for mitochondria to be key elements. With this damage are the cell types. We looked at human embryonic stem cells, and here we did our, an assay uh, labeling the potential foci of DNA damage double strand breaks using gamma H2AX immunocytochemistry. And we saw, yes, indeed, you did get damage to human embryonic stem cells, but interestingly, you didn't get damage when they were pluripotent. This green immunocytochemistry chemical co-marker is a marker of OCT4 expression, which is restricted to the pluripotent stem cell. Now, the pluripotent stem cell, interestingly, has very few mitochondria in it, and there is a change in the uh, respiration from a fairly anaerobic respiration to an aerobic respiration as stem cells develop, and their mitochondria change as well. So mitochondria are very important in this signaling process, it seems, as they are in the bystander effect, not only with the cell that sends the signal, but also in the cell that actually receives the signal. What about other barriers? We modeled a corneal barrier, and we also noticed a similar effect, that we could have signaling across a bilayered corneal barrier, but not a monolayered corneal barrier, that we had signaling when we, uh, uh, that was susceptible also to um, gap junction signals. Now, in our corneal barriers, unlike our BWO barriers, we had other things that came across. We were interested to see whether we might have any release of cytokines. So we did a cytokine screen and went to the immunologist and being Typical amateurs suggested that he should look at lots of cytokines and suggested 29 cytokines. The immunologists thought we were crazy. We would never see anything specific. So we did, in fact, see something very interesting. Again, our monolayered barriers didn't secrete cytokines. These are corneal barriers, not BWO barriers. Our bilayered barriers did, but we had specific cytokines that were released. We saw changes of IL-6, IL-8, MCP-1, GRO, and GMCSF. You look at the function of these cytokines, and they're all very different. I don't know whether this is significant or not, but there is a very interesting class of cytokine or chemokine called SASP. These are senescent-associated senescent -associated secretory phenotypes. These are specifically secreted from cells that show a persistent DNA damage response, such as what we've noted, but are noted in cells that are senescent. So we did a, we were interested therefore whether, although we're using um, a transformed cell types, whether our cells were in any way different with regard to their potential senescent phenotype. And we measured the telomere lengths of the two barriers. We noticed that there was a very dramatic difference in our corneal cells compared to our BWO cells. Our corneal cells had short telomeres, several of them, and they were within the range uh, that would be present in a normal cell that was undergoing senescence. Now, I'm not saying that there is for sure a relationship between telomere length and cytokine release, but inflammation, age, and cancer are closely related. So there is a potential for this telomere length to be in some way uh, involved in the secretion of cytokines from barriers. And it's interesting too that there are certain diseases such as preeclampsia where the telomeres have been reported to be much shorter in the placenta and also in which the same cytokines can be see seen increased in the patient's blood such as IL-6 and IL-8. So all this is very well. This is all done in vitro. Can you see any effects in vivo? 
So we used a, a rat as our model. We used a pregnant rat. And we thought we would have a look at two different stages of pregnancy. We, we looked at a stage, it has a 20-day gestation. We looked at a stage of 9.5 days, where the fetus is nourished by the yolk sac and the allantois. And then we looked later in pregnancy, at 12.5 days, where the fetus is actually nourished via the placenta. Now here, these mice have a trilamina placenta. They're not like the human placenta, which goes from a bilayer da down to a monolayer. So these are multi-layered barriers. But we thought we'd look at a monolayer barrier by actually looking at the um, cerebral cortex in the mother's brain. In other words, there would be a potential monolayer barrier between the mother's bloodstream, in which the nanoparticles have been injected, and the brain. And we used a we took the peripheral blood from the, uh, the embryo or from the fetus and assayed the level of DNA damage. When we injected early on in pregnancy, we saw no dramatic increase of DNA damage in the neonatal blood when we, or the embryonic blood. When we actually looked in the uh, at the later stage when the injection was done and we allowed these animals to survive for seven, six days. So these were injected at 12.5 days, seven days, sorry, and they were just newly born. Seven days later, there was DNA damage in the peripheral blood. So potentially, there is potentially, there is signaling in vivo. We looked at, we used cobalt chrome particles and it was therefore important to see could we see any cobalt and chromium in the embryos. We used a technique called ICPMS, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, which can detect um, metals down to parts per trillion and certainly saw no increase of cobalt or chromium in the fetuses, suggesting perhaps that if there was any metal transfer, certainly we couldn't detect it in the tissues of the embryo. So, <coughs> our signaling through the bilayer barrier is potentially restricted. If it occurs in vivo, it's potentially much more important early on in pregnancy than later on in pregnancy due to this change in the structure of the placenta. So, potentially, it may have some role to play in the way that a fetus might be damaged in pregnancy. There are about 2,500 teratogens that are known, and a common action of teratogens, one common action that has been singled out, is the ability of the teratogen to induce oxidative stress. I've highlighted different roles that mitochondrial free radicals can play. Potentially, there is a common mechanism. So you can see that maybe, and I'm not suggesting it's definite, but possibly that there is a common mechanism through the signaling from the barrier. At the moment, our work is also looking at other aspects of the fetus and whether there may be damage across it. We're interested now in whether the signaling across the barrier may cause changes to the central nervous system. And we also make models of placenta using primary trophoblast cells and have seen changes in human embryonic cortical neurons as a result of exposures. Um, here we're looking at oxygen. So to summarize, direct exposure of nanoparticles causes cytotoxicity, genotoxicity, immune effects. Indirect exposure, uh, in fact, causes genotoxicity and immune effects, but no cytogenetic no cytotoxicity, and it causes different genotoxicity. The indirect across, uh, effects across the barriers are mediated by signaling, initiated by oxygen-free radicals, occur through bilayer barriers, not monolayer barriers, and they may cause change to human fibroblasts, human embryonic stem cells, and as we're studying now, neurons from the cerebral cortex. And the unanswered question is whether this is important and whether this might be a mechanism for a birth defect in a child. Thank you very much. Thank you for this excellent presentation. Um,
we are off to a little bit of a late start, but I do think we have time for a couple of questions. Perhaps I could start with, with the first question. Um, uh, the, the fact that ATP is released is very interesting, and, and I understand it's a potential mechanism to explain the, the effects. Um, it's interesting because ATP is also a danger signal, and, and uh, had there been uh, phagocytic cells in the system, um, these cells may have responded or could have responded to ATP. In particular, macrophages, but also dendritic cells, are, have been shown recently to activate the inflammasome in response to ATP, leading to IL-1 beta secretion. So, so the question is uh, whether, and we do know that a number of different nanoparticles actually can activate the inflammasome in, in phagocytic cells, but that's a direct mechanism. Perhaps uh, one could infer from your presentation that there might be an indirect mechanism of inflammasome activation if ATP is released from some cells which then act on neighboring phagocytic cells. So have you looked at effects on immune competent cells such as macrophages? Uh, no, I haven't, but you're suggesting this um, so-called inflammatory synapse may be uh, present within the barrier. And indeed, that's quite possible that ATP could act on P2X7 receptors in a similar way that a macrophage may have effects on T cells through the inflammatory synapse. And I agree with you that that is a possibility. So, so again, there may be indirect effects also on, on immune competent cells. Which brings, uh, again, the, 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 the question of what is actually, I mean, referring back to the last session, what is a positive control when we are looking for a mechanism that is not yet discovered? Uh, um, so. uh, well, here we, we have used lots of different compounds to test our effect. So the best compound is oxygen. So this is most physiological. Simply changing the oxygen concentration will induce the signaling. Um, as well as that, we've used ions, as well as particles of different sizes. We've used antimycin A as another compound that could initiate the signaling. So I think in a mechanism like this where we don't understand Sorry, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an experiment like this where we don't fully understand the mechanism, it's very difficult to say that this is a precise positive control for what we see. On the other hand, what we can say is that you can create the same effects using all sorts of different exposures, including those that may be physiologically important. And that this is the limit to what we can um, do at the moment. Thank you very much. Yes. Is there a microphone? Yes. On this side. The, uh, Isabella De Angelis from National Institute of Health, Rome, Italy. Thank you very much for this excellent uh, talk. Uh, I would like to know if you have any information or idea if the same could be happen in other epithelial barrier, uh, like intestinal barrier or a skin barrier. Okay, so I think, <coughs> I don't know about the intestinal barrier, but I think an interesting barrier is the corneal barrier, and of all barriers, it's the most environmentally exposed to nanoparticles. Now, we do know that the cells beneath the corneal barrier may include structures like the lens, and certainly in, um, uh, in Africa, cataract is a huge problem where there may be damage, direct damage to the lens itself. So I think the, it would be a very interesting model to look at to see whether dust could act across a corneal barrier to cause secondary changes in, cell, in structures beneath the barrier such as the, as the lens and whether this may or may not be a mechanism for how cataracts are so uh, important. Of course, light is another thing that will, and we know that ultraviolet light may cause damage to a barrier too. With age, there may be a lack of protection of the corneal barrier due to a change in the tear film. The tear film becomes less able to uh, wash away these particles, so the corneal barrier may be more exposed as a result. Last question, Professor Vicky Stone. Um, I really enjoyed your, your presentation, it was fascinating. Um, you described the fact, I think this is how you described it, that you make your bilayers by allowing the cells to grow for longer in culture. 
I mean, another alternative is to seed a higher density of cells in the culture dish. Both of those protocols have the impact to change the phenotype of the cell. So how confident are you that the responses, the changes in responses that you're seeing are due to the bilayer effect rather than other changes associated with phenotypic changes due to longer culture time and higher cell density? Yeah, no, I, I, I take that point and indeed we did use different cell density as another control and saw the same effect between the monolayer and the bilayer barrier. Another way is to look at the actual human placenta itself to have a look at the behavior of that. And that's not perfect either because you'll have endothelial cells, you'll have fibroblasts there, you'll have blood there, and again you'll have a different phenotype perhaps in and a different composition of the cell types. We do see this effect using um, human placenta, but I fully take on, uh, I, I, you know, I, I take on board your point, and uh, it's a very difficult question to, to come to terms with. So we thank our keynote speaker once again. <laughs>